I, I'm not going to do a lot of in, you know introducing no. you. People know who you are, etc. Yeah. But given the current events, I wanted to start by asking you about Navalny. Okay. What do you think happened? And well, Putin killed Navalny. Whether he did it by poisoning him, or he did it by beating him to death, his people, or he simply through permanent keeping him in punishing cell. Uh, uh, it was slow. That's, it does matter. What's important is that Navalny did more than anybody in the world to unmask the real nature of this regime, uh, the dictatorial and corrupt nature of the regime, and personally Putin. Uh, and uh, he showed unbelievable courage and moral clarity doing all this. Uh, and uh, Putin is uh, uh, re very revengeful, very dictator, and also the one who saw real danger in the influence which had Navalny on the minds of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Uh, he decided to kill him long ago, ago, and he didn't succeed to poison him. To the contrary, this poisoning turned into the biggest accumulation for Putin. Uh, so he did it a different way, uh, but whatever was the way, it is uh, the revenge, the crime of Putin against his most outstanding opponent, who did more than anybody in the world to unmask, to unmask this regime. Uh, when you say uh, punishing cell, yeah. what is that? Punishing cell or card cell, it's small room, two or three meters to two or three meters, and it's uh, uh, very cold, and they take away all the warm clothes, and uh, three pieces of bread and three cups of hot water a day, and nobody to talk to, you are in full isolation. And uh, in our exchange of letters, we, Navalny wrote me from prison, and I answered him, uh, then he wrote again, uh, there was such a, black humor, uh, because I was telling you know that I spent during my nine years 405 days in punishing cell. And that was kind of record. So I feel very good uh, feeling that I'm, I, uh, I have this record. But I'm afraid that you're now going to beat it, because he, it was like the first year, he was already 150 days. Uh, and we were both like laughing about it. Uh, but what really happened that uh, he didn't beat my record because he killed him too early for this. And but he spent more than three hundred days in punishing cell for two something years, but it's very very difficult. I never heard about such thing. And uh, and just a day before he was brought to the trial for the for another fifteen days, and he was joking. He uh, he was very strong. Man, he never lost his ironic sense of humor, making fun of all his, uh, uh, all of these gods. Uh, and so I don't know what happened day after this. Maybe Putin simply saw his uh, smile and said, how long this guy can smile uh, and uh, everything was okay. Or maybe after all it is, this system of punching cells weakening people a lot. Once when I was 100 days in punch cell, I fell unconscious and they took me to the hospital and then brought, brought me back. But in my case, Soviet uh, leaders didn't want me to die. The, the pressure, they were very sensitive to the pressure from the West. Today, Putin is not sensitive because he already burned all his bridges. Uh, and probably that's the result. One of the things that Navalny embodied was a commitment to something greater than his own survival, greater than his own self-interest. Yeah. Um, and you also, um, that there's something worth giving your life for. Uh, people will say sacrificing your life, right. but I, I think it's you know, more yeah, well, something yeah, to give your life for. Uh, by going back to Russia, knowing that almost for sure he'll be killed, but definitely he will spend many, many years in prison, uh, Navalny showed clearly that physical survival is not the highest 
uh, value that uh, he continued his struggle and he thought that uh, this struggle is historical uh, struggle and in fact by going back to Russia he like gave a message to all the Russian citizens I am not afraid you also should not uh, be afraid and the struggle continues so yeah it is very important when you're in prison when they strengthen uh, threaten you with death it's very important uh, on very early stages to realize that if your aim will be physical survival then you're full in their heads then you can express anything they want uh, and that's why the aim cannot be your physical survival. The aim is that uh, you don't know how long will be your life, but you know that until the end you will be a free person. Uh, and that depends on you. And uh, Navalny was free person to the last moment of his life. And he, of course, he felt that he is serving, the, that he has a mission, a historic mission. And he was fulfilling this mission to the last moment of his life. Yeah. And you've, you've talked about freedom and belonging, that these yeah. are sort of fundamental needs. Um, for you, you also spent a time where people would have said you weren't free. But for you, you were free. Yeah. Um, what is true freedom? What does that mean? Freedom that you uh, say what you believe in and you two things which you want to do uh, and uh, uh, all your life is in accordance with your uh, beliefs uh, that's freedom and yes uh, uh, you, it, you can be restricted in physically uh, you can be put in the punishing cell uh, they can try to humiliate you in different ways uh, but you know that they cannot do it. They can humiliate you. Only you yourself can humiliate yourself if you will betray this uh, free, uh, idea of freedom that you are living with. And, and what, what does belonging mean? Uh, belonging means that I, I believe that every person wants to be free and uh, wants uh, uh, to have, uh, to see the life, uh, that life has meaning above your own existence because if there is no meaning except from your own existence then like like animals you see it's uh so there must be some ideas uh, which are uh, as important for you as your own life and maybe even more and so uh, the fact that you belong to some group of people or to some uh, 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 religious philosophy uh, uh, or professional, you are involved with the big group that it is very interesting for you. It's, it's very natural. People want to belong to something bigger than their own individual life. And uh, that's, that's identity. And I believe that these are very two fundamental feelings. Desire to be free means that nobody will tell me what to think. And that we belong, belong when there is a group of people who think like you and who have uh, and you have a common mission in this life. So one of the things that you saw more than 20 years ago, I think, was um, the problem of college campuses. And what you're talking about is making me think of that because uh, there's a different idea about belonging on college campuses and people don't seem to be particularly free. What, how did you start to notice that and what do you think is happening now? Yeah, well, uh... Uh, in 2003, I, uh, being a minister in the Israeli government, I had kind of tour over the universities because I was looking for the roots of anti-Semitism. And it was the time of Second Intifada, when on one hand, being Israel felt that we are fighting against terror, defending all the world, and there were terrorist attacks and suicide bombing practically every day in the streets. And on the other hand, you see here a lot of students who believe in all these lies. There was a film, Janine Janine, which was uh, inventing that, uh, invented that uh, Israel is involved in genocide in those days. And it was the time when hundreds of our citizens were killed by suicide movers and we were fighting against it. And then I heard from one student 
she was the postgraduate student in business school in Harvard. And she explained to me that she wanted very much to sign the letter, which was against the, the investment. It was like BDS, so in, in support of Israel. But she knows for sure that there will be few, three professors who are very important for her career who will not like it. And that's why she decided to be silent for a few years until her career is guaranteed. And I remember, I thought, my God, it's not in Moscow University in my days when people were double thinkers. Here in the free world. And then I started checking it and I saw, heard it more and more different campuses, how people are afraid to identify themselves with Israel. And then, in fact, I, uh, and, and the moment they do it, they, in fact, are moving more and more far from their own people. Uh, and they can uh, deceive themselves that it's only for the time of beginning their career, but in fact, that from now they will be double thinkers, like loyal Soviet citizens who are double thinkers. So it, and then I came and I said to Ariel Sharon that I really believe that the most important battlefield for the future of Jewish people is American universities. And they wrote article was traveling to occupied territories where occupied territories were American uh, universities. Well, just the beginning of all this centers for Middle East studies, which really became like the center of uh, anti-Israeli propaganda. So, but those were days when practically all this Israel as the last uh, uh, remnant of colonialism existed. So, but it was already dangerous enough, uh, all the slides that was important to fight against. But uh, with the time, all this postmodern neo-Marxist uh, critical theories emerged in addition to uh, anti-colonial, uh, anti-colonial, that there was that uh, this culture of the white uh, males uh, and uh, <clears throat> Uh, all this woke movement, and as a result, not only Israel became the last remnant of the colonialism, but also Jews, a uh, white, successful part of the population. And so the series which divides the world on oppressors and oppressed, uh, where the oppressors are always wrong, and the oppressed are always right. And that's why politically correct means that you should not permit the oppressors to speak and to make oppressed feel uh, uh, non-comfortable and all this cancel culture. It's all different sides of neo-Marxist world in which I, or Marxist world in which I grew. Uh, and it was clear that always here Israel and Jews will be on the wrong side of history and Palestinians uh, will be always on the right side of history. And that was the base of this a uh, new anti-Semitism, which puts together classical demonization hatred towards Jews with this newly born progressive uh, demonization of Israel. Uh, so yes, I saw it beginning 20 years ago, and then I started a number of projects and later the head of Jewish agency of sending uh, our representatives to, to, to campuses and doing other things. And uh, but. No doubt that today this uh, uh, classical anti-Semitism on the win wings of progressive theories went and turned into the powerful, uh, aggressive, uh, anti-liberal movement of the world. Yeah, um, I'd like to say a little more about doublethink because doublethink is obviously something that's necessary in a communist environment, and now we're seeing it in the neo-Marxist environment. Say more for people who don't know what doublethink is. Well, uh, in accordance with my theory, in every dictatorial regime, there are three categories of people. It's true believers, those who believe in this, uh, uh, that authority is right, uh, whether there is ideology like Marxist ideology, they believe in ideology, but if there is not much ideology, but they believe that that's the only way how the authorities should deal with these people. Uh, so, so they are loyal citizens. And there are dissidents, those who speak openly and are ready to pay their freedom at some time of their life against this regime. And then there is the third class, a numerous class, of people who don't believe in this ideology, who think that that is a bad regime, but they're afraid to speak. And so they pretend they are loyal citizens, not program. They behave like loyal citizens, and 
They are all marching on demonstrations, solidarity of their leaders. And you cannot really say, if you cannot look into the mind of these people, you cannot say who is loyal citizen and who is double thinker. But what you can say, or what I said in my book, The Case for Democracy, almost 20 years ago, is that the longer is dictatorship, the bigger is the number of double thinkers, because the more and more people are feeling these restrictions of the dictatorship and are unhappy with this, they're becoming uh, double thinkers. And revolution is when uh, in big masses of double thinkers cross the life, uh, this uh, line, and become uh, dissidents. So, uh, and, uh, and then I propose the test, whether you live in fear society or free society, town square test, if you go to the center of this town and can say whatever you think, and you will not put into the prison or will be punished for this, then free society can have many problems, but uh, you can speak freely your mind. And if not, then free society. So it was all good for dictatorships, and I felt uh, comfortable with the fact that suddenly I started seeing 20 years ago that this phenomenon of double thing comes to the free society. And today, many polls, many studies show that more and more Americans, especially young Americans, prefer not to uh, express publicly their views on one or another question. That means that uh, America is becoming a society of double thinkers. And that's very dangerous, because the moment citizens are ready to sacrifice their freedom, nothing will stop regime from becoming illiberal or even anti-liberal. Uh, and we cannot afford uh, to lose America as a liberal country, because uh, that's the only hope of the world to stay as a free world. Yeah, I, I, I want to talk about the, the history of Gaza, um, since, since we're now in a a war here in Israel with, you know, with Hamas in Gaza. Um, you resigned over the withdrawal from Gaza. Yeah. Um, say more about what what that was about. You you were uh, prescient in that you you said that just having a separation between Israel and the Palestinians is not going to allow for peace. We have to care about Palestinians, free society too. Well, uh, all this approach, which started from Oslo, by the way, that it's not our business and it's not important for us what kind of society and what kind of society live Palestinians. Uh, and to the contrary, what is important for peace is that we'll find a dictator who can guarantee our stability. And that was the idea of Oslo. We are bringing Arafat. We know that he is a ruthless dictator. And we say to Palestinians, whether you want or not, he will be your leader. And uh, we say to ourselves, our Prime Minister said that it's good that he's not restricted by democracy because that's how he will defeat Hamas much quicker than we can do it without free press and the uh, Supreme Court and human rights organizations, that's what was said. Uh, and I immediately said it's a big mistake because uh, the, the only way how a dictator can survive is to make his people to hate us because he needs external enemy. What other external enemy he will have except us? And then this, when, uh, ah, and in order he will be our dictator, we uh, decided to give him a lot of money, a lot of public money, we're giving a personal account to Arafat, in order he will be loyal to us. And it failed big. And after, not only he didn't defeat Hamas, Hamas defeated him, it was, okay, then another idea, okay, let's separate us from them. We, we can't really influence what kind of site will be, as Ariel Sharon was explaining me, that uh, when I decided to resign, uh, I was the first minister of the moment, votes in the government finished, and it was still almost half a year before this engagement, I resigned. And the Sharon with whom we had very good relations, you know, because of uh, anti-Semitism on campuses, and he told me, you are taking us to the places where nobody takes, and they like it, stay with the government even if you disagree. And then he explained me his ideology. Uh, they are there, we are here, we build well, if they will dare after this to have one shot in our direction, we can destroy whatever we want, the world will be with us, because the world sees how we gave them uh, full independence from us. Uh, for 10 years, uh, the world will not press us. I told him, you don't have 10 years, you don't have, maybe you have 10 days. Well, he had a couple of months, in fact. Uh, uh, and again, I was saying that 
That's not also, it's, we have to see to what extent we can encourage development of some civil society. We cannot do it for them, but we have to look for the allies who will be doing it. Uh, and then fortunately all this concept, and again, we started giving money or we, this policy was stick and carrot. We, when they attack us, we have to attack them strong and we have to give them some very strong uh, disincentive. Uh, yeah, disincentive. On the other hand, we permit to Qatar to give them a lot of money because after all, they also have to live and that's what will make them to wish to co uh, coexist with us. And all, everything what Qatar did and everything what uh, whoever did went to build the most powerful fortress under the earth and to prepare these attacks. So, the concept that it's not our business what's happening inside Persian society, I believe, was absolutely wrong. I hope that now it's, it's clear to everybody. And uh, we are paying a very big price uh, for our attempts to become partners of, of the terrorists, totalitarian terrorists. Uh, we have no choice now. If you want to continue to exist as a state, we have to destroy Hamas. Uh, we have to take control over the security. But we have immediately to start looking for the partners who can uh, make sure that society will be developing differently in us after this. How, um, how is, is we're going to find partners given that the United Nations and the apparatuses of the United Nations have been overrun by terrorists? Well, United Nations proved again and again that they can be partners in any way. United Nations are behind the Durban Conference, which started all this awful uh, campaign, anti-Semitic campaign, uh, saying that Israel is uh, an apartheid state. Apartheid state. Yeah. Uh, Say more about the Durban Conference. Huh? Say yeah. more for people who don't know about the Durban Conference. Yeah, well, uh, uh, in uh, the year two, for the year of 2000, there was prepared the first anti-racist uh, conference against racism by the United Nations. And the United Nations spent a lot of time, uh, like three years preparation, special committees were pre preparing different programs. So, and then when the conference really did take place, the only, the only topic which went out is that there is one state which continues the policy of the apartheid up to South Africa. And it deliberately was in South Africa, uh, that's Israel. And it was absolutely ridiculous. And uh, well, for me, as the one from the Soviet Union, it was something new because in 1975, the Soviet Union proposed a resolution that Zionism is racist. But then it was clear that the Soviet Union, with the other dictators and with the puppets from the Third World, uh, are voting for this. But uh, the Free World, of course, is against it. That's why the moment Soviet Union fell apart, the uh, United Nations ch ch changed it. Here, what was really alarming, that many free countries, many Western countries were at least neutral. They were afraid to take position. And the chairman of the, uh, this conference was Mrs. Robinson, I think, from Ireland who was really sympathetic to these uh, awful new blood libels against Israel. Uh, so again, uh, in fact, after this, I proposed my 3Ds, how, how the anti-Zionism can become anti-Semitic when there is demonization, legitimization, double standard towards Israel. It's the same as what anti-Semites do towards the Jews. Uh, but, uh, uh, coming back to our situation, of course, the United Nations is not a partner. But I believe that the more, as long as Hamas is not defeated, Arab countries also will be very reluctant to take initiative. And the Western countries don't see any other opportunity, or, or Abu Mazen, or Hamas, but somebody has to deal with it. I believe that the moment they are defeated, and the moment we try, uh, we try through other Arab countries directly try to appeal to Palestinians. Let's start. You you have to start looking for the normal life, and uh, but whoever will be leading you, you decide. But we only insist that there will be no education of hatred, and we don't want refugee camps. We want really to help in 
noble house for everybody. And we are ready to be partners in developing your economy, but only free private economy, not the one which belongs to the leaders because it immediately becomes uh, uh, the way to control the lives of the people. Uh, and therefore, those who want to have independent newspapers or human rights organizations or whatever, defending the groups of these or that people, uh, will be protected. Whoever is ready to run that society, uh, fulfilling these four demands, that's what I was proposing to Ariel Sharon and before uh, to Evan Barak, uh, uh, we should support. Uh, because we, we should not have any role there, except from security, of course, as long as uh, it's a uh, uh, society which has only uh, uh, the leaders who, uh, who are tyrannical leaders and don't have any other serious force. Uh, uh, all the security has to be in our hands. And as to the poll, whether it will be Arab countries, who will ch choose also Palestinian partners or Arab countries together with some uh, Western countries uh, looking for the partners among uh, Palestinians will accept anything with, uh, with such restrictions. Or the main demand, of course, is what kind of education will be there. And that was our demand for the last 30 years, which was never taken seriously. Uh, but this time uh, we have no choice. We, first of all, I hope in our changed our perception that it is important for us uh, what kind of society will be there. Uh, and if it will be another set of dictators, then on our, we, on our army will be controlling the station, nobody else. Uh, and having accepting that it is important for us what kind of uh, society to make sure that whoever will be leading this society uh, will accept four demands of ours. Um, you made me think of a couple of questions. The first is, my understanding is that it was just hours after the withdrawal that the first rockets happened um, in 2005. By 2007, when uh, Hamas took over, uh, there were something like 2,000 rockets that year. Yeah. Why wasn't there an overwhelming response militarily in the beginning to defeat the capability to create this, this military apparatus? Well, first of all, those who thought that uh, now we can do whatever, we, if, if they will shoot, we can do whatever we want, they were absolutely wrong. And uh, the pressure which was before Nizel was also uh, now. Uh, second, again, it was all this illusion that, okay, we have to uh, uh, give them opportunity to rule strong, to control their society, and, but, and we will be responsible on every rocket, we will send, we'll send 10 rockets, or they'll, God forbid, kill one of our citizens, will try to kill as many terrorists as possible. But after this, uh, let's give them another chance and let's uh, uh, give up to the pressure of the world to give them some more help. And if Qatar is ready to pay them, to pay the salaries for the Palestinian workers, t tens of millions of dollars every month, okay, it's all uh, gives us opportunity to have kind of stability. Uh, and the, it started from the election. You see, it was, uh, unfortunately, uh, disengagement was not American idea. It was purely, purely Ariel Sharon's idea. And I had very good relations with President Bush. And he told me, look, I have to rely on General Sharon. Uh, because I understood he himself was not sure that that's a good idea, but okay, Sharon wants it. But after this elections and other, it was purely American idea because somehow President Bush believed that uh, 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 elections that the highest moment of democracy. And I all the time was explaining, by the way, what I explained in the book, which he liked very much. There was one topic that elections is not the sign of democracy. Free elections and free society. And as long as you have, not only you don't have free society, you have uh, society which is all oriented on uh, tyrannic power. Elections, it's only a uh, continuation of this tyrannic power. And really what happened as a result of these elections, Hamas not only came to power, they threw from the roof. They killed in the most awful ways all the representatives of, uh, uh, of Arafat and uh, became even more ruthless uh, power.
So I think that all the statements of Ariel Sharon, uh, that the moment they'll shoot, we will shoot revolution. Uh, all these nice attempts of ours, I, I was involved before as a minister of industry, right, to have them uh, industrial zone, very modern industrial zone. And just before this engagement, there was initiative of uh, uh, Jewish philanthropists to pay to Israeli agriculture farms their money in order they'll keep them in good shape and give them to Palestinians. In and, Gaza. In Gaza. And one of my friends then called me to say that he's going to give this money uh, what I think about it. I said, look, whatever money can be given to Jews who are living in Gaza, I think it's good because they will need it. But if you really hope that that will help Palestinians, you'll see it will not take one year and it will be destroyed. And I was absolutely wrong. It took like 48 hours before they simply burned down all the agricultural farms which Jews left to them because uh, this new regime needed full control over the people. They didn't need uh, them to have a, like prior to agriculture. And fortunately, the uh, industrial zone, which I helped to build as a minister of this state, after the first military collision a few months after was fully destroyed and burnt down. Uh, so first of all, they, even before attacking us, they made sure that there nothing from the uh, normal life which uh, Jew, Jews left will remain. And, and all these Jewish settlements were turned into launching ports of the missiles. Just now, in the last weeks, we had to deal with this place where there is no people living in those places where there were Jewish settlements. But there was like a, it was a big launching port for the missiles and uh, for, uh, for underground uh, mili uh, military equipment and so on. And so Ironically, the only place yeah. that seems that wasn't under where people live. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask about uh, from what you had said is um, in, in uh, the schools, the UNRWA schools, of course they were teaching, and you mentioned the blood libel. Yeah. For people who aren't familiar with the blood libel, explain what that is. Well, uh, from the very early uh, centuries of Christianity, one of the first accusations against Jews was done that they are that for their matzah or their seder uh, pesach or, uh, uh, which is all of course celebration of uh, their betrayal of christ uh, and they uh, are using for their matzah they're using the blood of christian babies which looked like absolutely crazy idea but it became very popular i have to say even i lived in soviet union uh, when, of course, uh, Christianity had no influence. And I was meeting some intelligent people who were telling me, Lo, of course we understand, uh, we understand that you are not drinking blood of uh, Christian babies, uh, but you know why you are celebrating Seder Pesach with the red wine? Because your ancestors, hundreds of years ago, did use blood for that. And so the fact that it could survive for a thousand years, it says something. Uh, no, but it was actively used uh, in those early Christianity uh, with the idea that now uh, Christianity is replacing all this replacing theory that Judaism has no place in this world that because now the Christianity is new Judaism and all these uh, blood libels were needed to demonize, to compromise the old uh, religion. Uh, and uh, it survived for a thousand years. And one of our uh, wise uh, sages said once, it's good that it existed. Why? Because there were times when practical, all the world was sure that blood libel is the right thing. And every Jew knew that it's lie. So we Jews have to remember that even when all the world says about us some awful things, it can be a lie. And that is a, a good example. Yeah, so uh, uh, I have to say that in uh, in the end of 19th and beginning of 20th century, there were trials like Bailey's trial in the Russian Empire against Jews who were using the blood of uh, Christian babies. So it's one of the deepest uh, libels against Jews which survived for thousand years. Uh, now when we are speaking about new blood libels, uh, when uh, uh, some 
uh, Palestinian uh, terrorists accusing uh, uh, Israeli army that they, they go to Haiti not to help them against earthquake, but to harvest the organs of Haiti, or harvest the organs of Palestinians and to sell them. Uh, and that's what uh, I did. Do. It's like uh, modern blood libel. And uh, of course, to say that Israel is a apartheid state when uh, uh, Arabs are in the Supreme Court. And they are, well, uh, Arab judge is sending Israeli Jewish president to prison for sexual violence. <laughs> what kind of party it is? And, uh, with, but, uh, but I think more people in the world believe that we are apartheid state than know that we are not. So these are typical awful prejudices, extreme prejudices, which have nothing to do uh, with the reality. But uh, there are millions of, or hundreds of millions of people who believe in it. Yeah, and in the in the UNRWA educational materials are lies about history and uh, training to uh, ensure that children grow up to want to kill Jews. Um, I I understood that part of the origins of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, is involves the protocols, the protocols of the elders of Zion, which is yeah. a, another conspiracy theory, and. Um, that, that uh, somebody, I don't remember who said, a true believer, a, a Muslim brother said, a true believer is obligated to finish the work of Hitler. Yeah. So there's this now merging of Hitler's ideas about Jews with Arab sort of traditional anti-Semitism. Um, and then you have a society that believes these things. And you're saying that you have um, at least a hope, if not optimism, that that can be undone after this war. You cannot un finish with anti-Semitism. It exists for a thousand years and probably it shows that people need some uh, Zaza who is like Satan. You know, John Paul Sartre said that for anti-Semite, Jew is the closest to Satan. And uh, and uh, Europe, Christian Europe didn't have for a thousand years, didn't have any other living among them who was as good the symbol of Satan as Jew. And uh, the fact that in modern society, now even in America, we have this prejudice against Jews coming back, it shows that uh, it's something very deep. And that's why I don't think that our task must be to eliminate full anti-Semitism. Our task must be to make sure that anti-Semitism is not dangerous, it's not killing, it's, uh, that we are stronger than, uh, than anti-Semites. And of course, we are appealing to people to understand that how anti-Semitism is danger for the society itself, that uh, the first warning that your society stops being liberal is anti-Semitism. And so uh, uh, Europa and America is getting now very serious warning about themselves, about their future. I, uh, uh, Alan Finkelkraut, a Mar uh, French philosopher, Jewish, and once I asked him, uh, do you think uh, Jews have future in France? He said, I don't know, because I am not part of Jewish community. He said, but my concern is if there is future for France in France. Mm -hmm. So based on the anti-Semitism which is growing in France, he's concerned about French culture and French society. Who is that? Uh, uh, Alan Finkelkraut. Oh. Of course, uh, the traditional old anti-Semitism, uh, Hitler's anti-Semitism, is a big danger, but somehow the world at least once understood how dangerous it is. And though I heard even the Soviet Union from some people, oh, it's a pity that Hitler didn't finish his work. Uh, but uh, I think we are at the stage when these people by themselves are not dangerous because uh, the society is much stronger than these people. As to Arab anti-Semitism, I have to remind you that historically in Arab society, people, Jews felt themselves more comfortable than Christian society. And when Jews were expelled from Spain, the best heaven which they could find was Turkey. Uh, with all the problems, uh, it is the, the Zionism, which when it was meant that part of the territory which is under control of Muslims will become the territory which will be under the control of Jews. That what, uh, was the beginning of this new struggle against Jews. Again, Israel learned how to fight it. And uh, there are more, more and more countries in the Middle East who understand and who, in fact, uh, uh, want together with us fight against 
uh, anti-Semitism as Bahrain leaders told me that opposed it's, it's our interest uh, that we will uh, cooperate. What is so dangerous that liberal world, the free world, starts betraying us. That uh, that these so-called progressive views, which have nothing with liberals, by the way, it's neo-Marxist ideas uh, uh, of the world of oppressors against oppressed, where Jews and Israel will be always among the oppressors. And that's what makes it so potential, explosive and dangerous. Because after all, we can fight uh, against anti-Semitism with the help of liberal ideas, only with the help of liberal ideas. And if liberal world becomes illiberal, betraying its own liberal ideas in favor of so-called progressive, in fact, neo-Marxist ideas, that is a real danger. Well, you're making me think about, um, I just have two more questions. Uh, one about American campuses um, that on October 8th, 9th, 10th, um, we saw on campus and off campus um, students who were rallying for Hamas. Yeah. We're saying that it, it's not terrorism, it's resistance. We're saying glory to the martyrs and um, from the river to the sea. Now, some of these kids don't know what river, what sea, etc. But there are people on campus who do know that they're calling for the destruction of the state of Israel. Um, and uh, and globalize the intifada. I mean, that's less ambiguous than if you don't know yeah. the river, the river or the sea. What do you make of this? Of course, it, Israelis were absolutely shocked by what happens on the seventh of October, and uh, we correctly so have to make a very serious research: what happened with our army, what happened with our intelligence, what happened with our politicians. Where were mistakes made? I believe that we start making these mistakes from Oslo and uh, to the last months. But that has to be that self-search and study. Uh, uh, but immediate co conclusion was that Israel as a society was absolutely united and is fighting now and hopefully winning this awful enemy. But no less shocking was the fact that the first reaction which we received from the free world, all of the first. Uh, President Biden was okay immediately saying that we will send him, I mean, but then there was letter of 31 students organization of Harvard, really like 48 hours after this, saying that only Israel can be uh, blamed, in fact, saying that that's the beginning of liberation. And I think even more uh, uh, important than students, that they were professors, teachers, who are teaching about micro microaggression, how it is important to be politically correct, and they were welcoming it as the beginning of liberation. And I hope that it finally showed, uh, uh, for some years I was saying that the most important struggle in America is not between uh, left and right, but between liberals and progressives. Mm -hmm. That progressives are not allies, they are enemies of liberalism. And, uh, it was very difficult for many organizations, especially for Jewish liberal organizations, to accept it. I remember how again and again, let's say, human, women's organizations, Jewish women's organizations, uh, had to decide whether to put, participate in the March of One Million Women on Washington, if you remember, which was led by open anti-Semites. But after some uh, discussion, they were saying, doesn't matter, even if these people hate Israel, and some of them hate uh, Jews, but the very idea of the struggle for women's rights is so important that we have to use all the allies. We have to join all these allies who are fighting for liberal values. And here, the most awful violation of women's rights, the most awful uh, rape uh, pogrom is taking place, and these organizations are not ready to say a word. Uh, simply are silent. Why? Because. Uh, it is those who are raping are on the side of oppressed, those who are raped are on the side, uh, side of oppressors. So it's, uh, it's very difficult for them. But that's like the best proof that progressive organizations are not liberal organizations. So uh, I, I hope, first of all, that uh, liberals of America, those for whom it is uh, liberal values are important, will understand who are their real allies and who are their enemies. Uh, 
Uh, but the second thing which uh, has to be learned and has to be uh, understood from this that the uh, the idea uh, which is so dear to so many professors that the world will be liberated by the revolution of oppressed. And that's why, by the way, when they participate, the river, from the river to the sea was invented by those who want to destroy Israel. But when thousands of students and professors are marching under the slogan, and they say, well, they don't know where is the river to the sea, it doesn't matter, because they want liberation of all the world from oppressors. And from every sea, the river to every sea, it has to happen. So it so happens that it starts from Palestine. But they we are speaking about the world liberation, about the world revolution. It's exactly like this idea of the old communist revolution, uh, under this uh, idea of the real freedom, which brought to the most awful tyrannic regimes of the world. And that is the danger that so many uh, prof so many intellectuals believe that. Uh, uh, that the real liberation, the real defense of liberal values will come through the world revolt of oppressed against oppressors. Uh, and, uh, and then they're going back to the most primitive Lenin's Bolsheviks uh, series. And the fact that that's happening not in this, uh, in Russia, which didn't, didn't know in its history what's democracy, but it's happening in the center of the intellectual power in the United States of America, the most free place in the world. That's really alarming. So that's what concerns me much more than anti-Semitism in Christian and Muslim world, because we know how to deal with this. Yeah. Um, the last question is, and you said a bit about the um, that Israel society came together after October 7th. Before October 7th, there was a lot of, of division. Um, and now there's this sense of unity and service and selflessness. How will Israel maintain that sense and not fall back into the polarization and infighting that happened before October 7th? Well, we were speaking in the beginning about the importance of this feeling of historical mission, that there are things that are more important than life. I think it's very strong and very deep in Jewish people in general and in Israelis. And what happened in the last year, it, it seemed really that people are so polarized and that definitely young generation does know uh, where to take all these ideologies. And that's like post-Zionism. We found out that it's all nothing, that it's uh, this on the surface, that deep in their hearts, Jews, Jewish people, are very true to their mission in this world and very true out to the idea of Jewish state as the only way to continue our, our mission. Uh, and uh, with all the skepticism and cynicism about young generation, a young generation of Jews today shows to all, Israel, to all the Jews of the world uh, what is idealism and what is to, that there are things more important than your physical survival. And uh, I hope that that new spirit of unity or togetherness uh, they will bring them to all the other spheres of our life, including our politics. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much.